observers uh, have said that there is an alliance, either explicit or tacit alliance, between the United States and Saudi Arabia against Russia and Iran. By keeping oil prices low, these countries, Russia and Iran, will see their economies very damaged. Is that a, a vision you share? Well, I think the reason that oil prices have come down as much have really much more to do with the lack of growth around the world, which you obviously know more about than anybody. And then secondly, the, the massive increase in, in, in output in the United States. If the United States had not added three or four million barrels a day over the last four years to the oil it's producing, we would have a fundamentally different uh, energy picture in the world and a fundamentally higher price than we do now. So I think the conspiracy theories are, are, are largely off. Saudi Arabia, though, does need to keep producing oil because its own population is now so large. It needs to, it needs to make up for a lower price, ironically enough, by keeping output levels very high. You have been a, a critic of President Obama and its policies in the Middle East. What are your main criticisms? Well, I was very critical in some ways of his predecessor for things he did, uh, the, the 2003 Iraq war, which I think was, was a bad set of decisions. But you were in government at the time. Yeah, but there's a difference, as you know, between being in government and controlling policy. I was a voice against what we did, but I was just that, and I was a minority uh, voice. I think for this president, the biggest criticisms are not so much what he's done, even though I disagreed, say, with the policy in Libya, as what he hasn't done. Uh, not following through on the various threats in Syria, not doing more three or four years ago to help the Syrian opposition, not doing more in Libya after he helped overthrow uh, Mr. Gaddafi, not doing more in Asia to take a rhetorical idea, this pivot, the United States doing more in the Asia Pacific, not translating that into actual policy. You're writing about what you see as the unraveling. The unraveling of what? Uh, the academic phrase would be world order, essentially the degree of stability in the world, the degree to which the major countries in the world are willing and able to try to encourage a set of rules and a, and a set of behaviors. And what we're seeing is much greater instability in the Middle East. We've obviously seen some in uh, Ukraine. There's the potential for it on a large scale in, in Asia. We're not seeing movement on global efforts against climate change or in favor of trade. The world response to Ebola has been truly inadequate. So you add all these things up and you would say, this, all this talk of an international community, it's more talk than reality. But that has been always the case. The international community has always lagged behind needs and expectations. You're right, but I think the gap is getting bigger. The Middle East is, I believe, on the, 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 the edge of what you might call a new 30 years war, where you could have mass, massive instability. We did have many successful global trade talks. We're not going to have one now. We've had various conferences to try to get a global approach to climate. I simply don't see it uh, happening. So you're right, there always has been a gap or a lag between uh, global arrangements and the global challenges. I think that gap is getting larger. So, and what needs to be done then? What's the solution? Uh, solution's a word I don't use a lot. In some, in some cases, like the Middle East, there isn't a solution. Some situations aren't problems to be solved. They're conditions to be managed. And I would say in a place like the Middle East, that's, that's maybe the most you could hope for. We maybe can get an understanding with Iran. That would be good. We can do certain things against, say, Ebola. We could have an Asian trade. Uh, deal. So you don't get necessarily global solutions, but you could do things that would make the situation in some cases better, or in other cases at least less bad. You are the president of the Council on Foreign Relations. And this is an influential institution, and the mission of that institution is to help the United States engage with the world. You are an internationalist institution. And yet, you just wrote a book uh, that says that uh, the U.S., in order to address its international challenges ought to look inside. There's no, there's no contradiction. The book Foreign Policy begins at home. That's true. I do not say that foreign policy ends at home. The United States needs to stay active in the world. Quite honestly, if we are not active, the world is not going to manage itself. To use an economics metaphor, there's no invisible hand, as Adam Smith said about the market. Without the United States, you simply do not have other countries willing and able to play a large role in promoting regional and, and global order. And one of the reasons 
the situation in the world has gotten worse if the United States is in fact playing, playing less of a role. But we do need to be, do more at home at the same time. We need to generate the resources. We need a higher standard of living so Americans are going to be willing to look at the world and not see it as somehow a distraction or in competition. We need to do more at home so we can set an example that other societies around the world will look up to, respect, and want to emulate. But if we are seen as politically uh, not functioning at home, if our economy is not growing at the rates it, it should grow, we will not have the capacity and we will not have the focus on the world that we need. To conclude, um, there are millions of Latin Americans uh, watching us now. What would you tell them about Latin America in this world that you have just described, in which there's unraveling, instability, and all kinds of challenges that are going unmet? Well, the good news is that Latin America is a little bit of an exception. If you and I had been having this conversation 20 or 30 years ago, and I had said to you, and I had described Latin America today, you would have said, that's too optimistic. Well, it's turned out to be okay. You don't have, for example, interstate wars in Latin America. You don't have massive threats of nuclear proliferation. You don't have massive terrorism uh, threats. Uh, you've had significant economic growth in, in many uh, countries. So all in all, you'd have to say not bad. It's more open politically than it was on balance. Now, there's still challenges, and I'm not going to sit here and say there's not challenges in Venezuela or Argentina or Brazil or what have you. But all in all, as a region of the world, Latin America looks, looks pretty stable. And again, if you took a snapshot today and you compared it to 20 years ago, you would say there has been significant progress. The challenge is to make 20 years from now better than it is today, and it's not inevitable that it will be, but I think the possibility is real. Richard Haas is the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, one of the most influential institutions shaping opinion and commentary about the world in the United States. Thank you very much, Dr. Haas. Thanks for having me.